Squirrels, I read to y'all like 30 minutes last night, and then poof, it went away and never to be found again. And I thought I had cleaned out, you know, and made room for more videos. I could not find any videos. So I was like, what is going on? Well, today I found a whole bunch of videos, so I cleared them out. I just could I didn't have the heart to do it. I was, oh, I was not a happy granny. <laughs> Let's go ahead. <laughs> a Christmas story. No, oh, what is this? A country Christmas. Part four. I hope you're going to spare me a posy for tomorrow night since I could be fine in no other way to do honor to, to the dance Miss Sophie proposes for us. He said, leaning in the bay window to look down on the little girl with the devoted air he usually wore for pretty women. Anything you like, I should be so glad to have you wear my flowers. There will be enough for all, and I've nothing else to give to people who have made me as happy as Cousin Sophie and you, answered Ruth, half drowning her great calla, is calla lily, as she spoke with grateful warmth. You must make her happy by accepting the invitation to go home with her, which I heard given last night. A peep at the world would do you good and be a pleasant change, I think. Oh, very pleasant, but would it do me good? And Ruth looked up with sudden seriousness in her blue eyes as a child. Questions an elder, eager yet wistful. Why not? asked Randall, wondering at, at the hesitation. Well, I might grow discontented with things here if I saw splendid houses and fine people. I'm very happy now, and it would break my heart to lose that happiness or ever learn to be ashamed of home. <clears throat> but don't you long for more pleasure, new scenes, and other friends than these? asked the man, touched by the little creature's loyalty to the things she knew and loved. Very often, but Mother says when I'm ready, they will come, so I wait and try not to be impatient. But Ruth's eyes looked out over the green leaves, leaves as if the longing was very strong within her to see more of the unknown world lying beyond the mountains that hemmed her in. It's natural for birds to hop out of the nest, so I shall... I shall expect to see you over there before long and ask you how you enjoy your first flight, said Randall in a paternal tone that had a curious effect on Ruth. To his surprise, she laughed, then blushed like one of her own roses and answered with a demure dignity that was very pretty to see. I intend to hop soon, but it won't be a very long flight. We're very far from Mother. She can't spare me, and nobody in the world can fill her place to me. Bless the child. Does she think I'm going to make love to her? Thought Randall. Much amused, but quite mistaken. Wiser women had thought so when he assumed the caressing air with which he beguiled them into the little revelations of the character he liked to use as the south wind makes flowers open their hearts to give up their odor, then leaves them to carry it elsewhere, the more welcome for the stolen sweetness. Perhaps you're right, the maternal wing is safe shelter for confiding little souls like you, Miss Ruth. You'll be as comfortable here as your flowers in this sunny window, he said carelessly pinching geranium leaves and ruffling the roses till the pink petals of the largest fluttered to the floor, as if she instinctively felt and resented something in the man which his act symbolized. The girl answered quietly as she went on with her work, Yes, if the frost does not touch me or careless people spoil me too soon. Before Randall could reply, Aunt Plummy approached like a maternal hen who sees her chicken in danger. Saul's going to haul wood after he's done his chores, and maybe you'd like to go along? The view is good, the road's well broke, and the day uncommon fine. Thanks, it will be a delight it will be delightful, I dare say, politely responded the lion with a secret shudder at the idea of a rural 
promenade at 8 a.m. in the winter. Come on, then. We'll feed the stock, and then I'll show you how to yoke oxen, said Saul with a twinkle in his eye as he led the way when his new aide had muffled himself up as if for a polar voyage. <laughs> now that's too bad of Saul. He did it on purpose just to please you, Sophie, cried Ruth pleasantly. And the girls ran to the window to behold Randall bravely following his host with a pail of pig's food in each hand and an expression <laughs> expression of resigned disgust upon his aristocratic face. To what base uses may we come, quoted Emily as they all nodded and smiled upon the victim as he looked back from the barnyard where he was clamorously welcomed by his new charges. It's rather a shock at first, but it'll do him good, and Sal won't be too hard upon him, I'm sure, said Sophie, going back to her work, while Ruth turned her best buds to the sun that they might be ready for a peace offering tomorrow. Uh, there was a merry clatter in the big kitchen for an hour. Then Aunt Plummy and her daughter shut themselves up in the pantry to perform some culinary rites and the young ladies went to inspect certain antique costumes laid forth in Sophie's room. You see, Em, I thought it would be appropriate to the house and season to have an old-fashioned dance. Aunt has quantities of ancient finery stowed away, for great-grandfather Bassett was a fine old gentleman, and his family lived in state. Take your choice of the crimson, blue, or silver gray damask. Ruth is to wear the worked muslin and quilted white satin skirt with that coquettish hat. Being dark, I'll take the red and trim it up with this fine lace. You must wear the blue and primrose with the distracted, distracting high-heeled shoes. Have you any suits for the men? Asked Emily, throwing herself at once into the all-absorbing matter of costume. A claret velvet coat and vest, silk stockings, cocked hat, and snuff box for Randall. Nothing large enough for Saul, so he must wear his uniform. Won't Aunt Plummy be superb in this plum-colored satin and immense cap? A delightful morning was spent in adapting the faded finery of the past to the blooming beauty of the present, and time and tongues flew till the toot of a horn called them down to dinner. The girls were amazed to see Randall come whistling up the road with his trousers tucked into his boots, <laughs> blue mittens on his hands, and an unusual amount of energy in his whole figure as he drove the oxen while Saul laughed at his vain attempts to guide the bewildered beasts. It's immense, the view from the hill is well worth seeing, for the snow glorifies the landscape and reminds one of Switzerland. I'm going to make a sketch of it this afternoon. Better come and enjoy the delicious freshness, young ladies. Randall was eating with such an appetite that he did not see the glances the girls exchanged as they promised to go. Bring home some more winter green. I want things to be real nice, and we haven't enough for the kitchen, said Ruth, dimpling with girlish delight as she imagined herself dancing under the green garlands in her grandmother's wedding gown. It was very lovely on the hill. As far as the eye could reach lay the wintry landscape, sparkling with the brief beauty of sunshine on virgin snow. Pines sighed overhead. Hardy birds flitted to and fro, and in all the trodden spots rose the little spires of evergreen ready for its Christmas duty. Deeper in the woods sounded the measured ring of axes, the crash of falling trees, while the red shirts of the men added color to the scene, and a fresh wind brought the aromatic breath of newly cloven hemlock and pine. How beautiful it is! I never knew before what winter, wood <coughs> winter woods were like, did you, Sophie? Asked Emily, sitting on a stump to enjoy the novel pleasure at her ease. 
I've found out lately Saul lets me come as often as I like, and this fine air seems to make a new creature of me, answered Sophie, looking about her with sparkling eyes as if this was a kingdom where she reigned supreme. Something is making a new creature of you. That's very evident. I haven't yet discovered whether it's the air or some magic herb among that green stuff you're gathering so diligently. And Emily laughed to see the color deepen beautifully in her friend's half-averted face. Scarlet is the only wear just now, I find. If we are lost like babes in the wood, there are plenty of red breasts to cover us with leaves. And Randall joined Emily's laugh with a glance at Saul, who had just pulled his coat off. You wanted to see this tree go down, so stand from under and I'll show you how it's done, said the farmer, taking up his axe. Not unwilling to gratify his guest and display his manly accomplishments at the same time. It was a fine in sight, the stalwart man swinging his axe with magnificent strength and skill, each blow sending a thrill through the stately tree, till its heart was reached and it tottered to its fall. Never pausing for breath, Saul shook his yellow mane out of his eyes and hewed away, while the drop stood on his forehead and his arm ached as he bent on distinguishing distinguishing himself as if he had been a knight tilting against his rival for his lady's favor. I don't know which to admire most, the man or his muscle. One doesn't often see such vigor, size, and comeliness in these degenerate days, said Randall, mentally booking the fine figure in the red shirt. I think we have discovered a rough a rough diamond. I only wonder if Sophie's going to try and polish it, answered Emily, glancing at her friend who stood a little apart, watching the rise and fall of the axe as intently as if her fate depended on it. Down rushed the, last, down rushed the tree at last, and leaving them to examine a crow's nest in its branches, Saul went off to his men as if he found the praises of his prowess rather too much for him. Randall fell to sketching the girls to their garland making, and for a little while the sunny woodland nook was full of lively chat and pleasant laughter, for the air exhilarated them all like wine. Suddenly a man came running from the wood, pale and anxious, saying as he hastened by for help, Blasted tree fell on him, bleed to death before the doctor comes. Who, who, cried the startled trio. But the man ran on with some breathless, some breathless reply in, in which only a name was audible, Bassett. The deuce it is, and Randall dropped his pencil while the girls sprang up in dismay. Then, with one impulse, they hastened to the distant group, half visible behind the fallen trees and corded wood. Sophie was there first, and forcing, forcing her way through the little crowd of men, saw a red-shirted figure on the ground, crushed and bleeding, and threw herself down beside it with a cry that pierced the hearts of those who heard it. In the act, she saw it was not Saul. Uh. And covered her bewildered face as if to hide its joy. A strong arm lifted her and the familiar voice said cheeringly, I'm all right, dear. Poor Bruce is hurt, though. But we've sent for help. Better go right home and forget all about it. Yes, I will, if I can do nothing, and Sophie meekly returned to her friends who stood outside the circle, over which Paul's head towered, and ass assuring them of his safety. Hoping they had not seen her agitation, she led Emily away, leaving Randall to give what aid he could, and bring them news of the poor woodchopper's state. 
Aunt Plummy produced the camp for the moment she saw Sophie's pale face and made her lie down. While the brave old lady trudged briskly off with bandages and brandy to the scene of action. On her return, she brought comfortable news of the man, so the little flurry blew over and was forgotten by all but Sophie, who remained pale and quiet all the evening, tying evergreen as if her life depended on it. A good night's sleep will set her up. She ain't used to such things, dear child, and needs cossetin', said Aunt Plummy, pouring, purring over her until she was in bed with a hot stone at her feet and a bowl of herb tea to quiet her nerves. An hour later, when Emily went up, she peeped in to see if Sophie was sleeping nicely and was surprised to find the invalid wrapped in a dressing gown, writing busily. Last will and testament? Or sudden inspiration, dear? How are you? Faint or feverish? Delirious or in the dumps? Saul looks so anxious, and Mrs. Bassett hushes us all up so. I came to bed, leaving Randall to entertain Ruth. As she spoke, Emily saw the papers disappear in a portfolio, and Sophie rose with a yawn. I was writing letters, but I'm sleepy now, quite over my foolish fright, thank you. Go and get your beauty sleep that you may dazzle the natives tomorrow. So glad, good night, and Emily went away saying to herself, something's going on, and I must find out what it is before I leave. Sophie can't blind me. But Sophie did all the next day, being delightfully gay at the dinner and devoting herself to the young minister who was invited to meet the distinguished novelist, and evidently being afraid of him gladly basked in the smiles of his charming neighbor. A dashing sleigh ride accompanied, no, occupied the afternoon and then great was the fun and excitement over the costumes. Aunt Plummy laughed till the tear <coughs> <coughs> tears rolled down her cheeks. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Vibrations must make my <laughs> vibrations. Mm, as the girls compressed her into the plum colored gown with its short waist leg of mutton sleeves and narrow skirt, but a worked scarf hid all deficiencies, <laughs> and the towering cap struck all into the soul of the most frivolous observer. Keep an eye on me, girls, for I shall certainly split somewheres, <laughs> or lose my headpiece off when I'm trotting round. What would my blessed mother say if she could see me rigged out in her best things? And with a smile and a sigh, the old lady departed to look after, and in quotations, the boys, and see what the supper, that the supper was all right. Three prettier damsels never tripped down the wide staircase than the brilliant brunette in crimson brocade. <clears throat> <clears throat> the pensive blonde and blue, or the rosy little bride in old muslin and white satin. A gallant court gentleman met them in the hall with a superb bow and escorted them to the parlor, where Grandma Bassett's ghost was discovered dancing with a modern major in full uniform. Mutual admiration and many compliments followed till other ancient ladies and gentlemen arrived in all manner of queer costumes, and the old house seemed to wake from its humdrum quietude to sudden music and merriment, as if a past generation had returned to keep its Christmas there. The village fiddler soon struck up the good old tunes, and then the strangers saw dancing that filled them with mingled mirth and envy. 
It was so droll, yet so hearty. The young men, unusually awkward in their grandfather's knee breeches, flapping vests, and swallowtail coats, footed it bravely with the buxom girls who were the prettier for their quaintness, and danced with such vigor that their high combs stood awry. Their furbelows waved wildly, and their cheeks were as red as their breast knots or hose. It was impossible to stand still and no, and one after the other the city folk yielded to the spell. Randall leading off with Ruth, Sophie swept away by Saul, and Emily being taken possession of by a young giant of eighteen who spun her around with boyish impetuosity that took her breath away. Even Aunt Plummy was discovered jigging it alone in the pantry, <laughs> as if the music was too much for her, and the plates and the glasses jingled gaily on the shelves in time to Money Musk and Fisher's Hornpipe. A pause came at last, however, and fans fluttered, heated brows were wiped, jokes were made, lovers exchanged confidences, and every nook and corner held a man and maid carrying on the sweet game which is never out of fashion. There was a glitter of gold lace in the back entry and a train of blue and primrose shone in the dim light. There was a richer crimson than that of the geraniums in the deep window, and a dainty shoe tapped the bare floor impatiently as the brilliant black eyes looked everywhere for the court gentleman, while their owner listened to the gruff prattle of an enamored boy. But in the upper hall walked a little white ghost as if waiting for some shadowy companion, and when a dark form appeared ran to take its arms, saying in a tone of soft satisfaction, I was so afraid you wouldn't come. Why did you leave me, Ruth? answered a manly voice in a tone of surprise. Though the small hand slipping from the velvet coat sleeve was replaced as if it was a pleasure to feel it there. A pause, and then the other voice answered demurely, Because I was afraid my head would be turned by the fine things you were saying. It's impossible to help saying what one feels to such an artless little creature as you. It does me good to admire anything so fresh and sweet and won't harm you. It might if, if what, my daisy? I believed it, and a laugh seemed to finish the, un the broken sentence better than the words. You may, Ruth, for I do sincerely admire the most genuine girl I have seen for a long time. And walking here with you in your bridal white, I was just asking myself if I should not be a happier man with a home of my own and a little wife hanging on my arm than drifting about the world as I do now, with only myself to care for. I know you would, and Ruth spoke so earnestly that Randall was both touched and startled, fearing he had ventured too far in a mood of unwanted sentiment, born of the romance of the hour and the sweet frankness of his companion. Then you don't think it would be rash for some sweet woman to take me in hand and make me happy since fame as a failure? Oh no, it would be easy work if she loved you. I, I know someone if I only dared to tell her name. Upon my soul, this is cool. And Randall looked down, wondering if the audacious lady on his arm could be shy Ruth. If he had seen the malicious merriment in her eyes, he would have been more humiliated still, but they were modestly averted and the face under the little hat was full of a soft agitation, rather dangerous even to a man of the world. <clears throat> she is a captivating little creature, but it's too soon for anything but 
but a mild flirtation, I must delay further innocent revelations, or I shall do something rash. While making this excellent resolution, Randall had been pressing the hand upon his arm and gently pacing down the dimly lighted hall with the sound of music in his ears. Ruth's sweetest roses in his buttonhole and a loving little girl beside him, as he thought. You shall tell me by and by when we are in town. I'm sure you will, and meanwhile, don't forget me. I'm going in the spring, but I shall not be with Sophie, answered Ruth in a whisper. With whom, then? I shall long to see you. With my husband. I'm to be married in May. The deuce you are, escaped Randall as he stopped short to stare at his companion. Sure she was not in earnest, but she was. As he looked, the sound of steps coming up the back stairs made her whole face flush and brighten with the unmistakable glow of happy love, and she completed Randall's astonishment by running into the arms of the young minister, saying with an irrepressible laugh, Oh, John, why didn't you come before? And I think I'll stop right there. Not a whole lot more, but I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. 26 minutes. Oh, well. Maybe I'll finish that and start another one next time. Love y'all. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. Where's my son? I was down there. Oh, this nose. Itchy nose. It's my hair's tickling it, too. Bye, y'all. Love you.